There's the bell. Soccer is in session. Welcome to this week's episode, March 8th, presented by Kaiser Permanente. Thank you so much to Kaiser Permanente for helping soccer down here cover soccer all over the state of Georgia at every single level. My name's Jason Longshore. It has been a busy week in the soccer universe when it comes to Georgia high school. We're going to try to get you caught up on that. You're going to hear from a couple of coaches as well. Plenty of things going on to get caught up on. I want to start with the last two games that I've had the chance to call. Uh, John Nelson joined us on Friday at Riverwood, and it was an upset special in the first match of the night. The Lakeside Vikings came in ranked number 10 in the state. Riverwood, the hosts, came in without having scored a goal all season long. So obviously they had not won a match all season. And the Raiders looked great in the performance. It wasn't a fluky sort of win. Riverwood played really well and gets the 3-1 win to start the night. Second match of the night on the boys' side, Riverwood, one of the top teams in the state in 6A. They showed that quality in their 2-0 win against Lakeside. It wasn't an easy match, though. Lakeside had opportunities. Riverwood scored on a quick transition in the first half. Lakeside really came back into the game. Uh, The winger on the left side, Brian Zatina, had a great sequence in the second half where he was so dangerous, creating opportunities, earning a penalty kick. He stepped up to the spot. Here's what it sounded like as he faced Riverwood goalkeeper Elijah Buford. Clock stopped at 19.50 left. Zatina backs up to the top of the 18, about a six-yard run-up. Buford, motionless, middle of the goal, staring Zatina down. Zatina staring at the ball. Whistle blown. Zatina save Buford! Tried to play it through the middle. Buford able to make a save with his leg. Massive save, Elijah Buford. The momentum completely changed with the save from Buford. He had another huge save on the night. And then going the other way, as we so often see, The Raiders put the game away through Gail Garcia. Loaded into the hands of Buford. Long ball played forward. Garcia touch. Goal, goal, goal. Riverwood out of nothing. Gail Garcia makes it 2-0. Just a long ball played down the middle. It takes a deflection. Gail Garcia gets through and quick shot, quick strike, quick 2-0 Raiders. It was a long ball from Buford, flicked on. Garcia pounces on it. Great finish from him, and that put the game away. Raiders won 2-0. They have climbed a spot in the new state rankings. We'll talk about that here in just a bit. But last night, We were at Campbell High School. Jared Smith joined me in the booth for the second leg of the Battle of Windy Hill. First time out this season at Osborne, Campbell 1-2-1. Osborne came to Campbell looking to flip the script, and it was a wild match. Just a crazy night in Smyrna. It was a lot of fun. Thanks to everybody at Campbell for all the hospitality and all the great information. Same to you guys at Osborne. But thank you for having us. Uh, it was a blast to call. My, my voice is suffering a little bit today because of how crazy it was. I want to give you a couple of the goals from this one. Let's start with the opener for the Cardinals. Especially for as high of a line as they're playing. Moise Pierre down the right side, dribbles past one, shot near post, in, goal, 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 Osborne, Moise Pierre. Just listen to that crowd at Campbell last night, and it was 
you know, shaded towards Campbell, obviously the home team, but there were a lot of Osborne fans there. It's not very far you could walk, basically. It was a, an awesome atmosphere. It was a lot of fun. Moise Pierre came off the bench. Great goal to open things up. Campbell was not going to be denied for long, and they leveled it right before the end of the half. Carpenter on the right side. Oh, what a tackle. He's dispossessed, but he gets it back. Justin Carpenter into the 18. Oh, Big tackle. tackle. Sarah Magic, top of the 18. Shot. Goal, goal, goal. Campbell Spartans. Four seconds left on the clock. Sinan Sarah Magic equalizes. Created on the opposite side by Scott Carpenter. Sarah Magic's one of the top players in the state this season. Osborne did a pretty good job of keeping him in check as much as you can, such a talented player. He got the the equalizer with just a few seconds left on the clock before the halftime break. Second half came out, and Osborne looked great to start things off. They made it 2-1. Longer throw to the near post. This time flicked on and in. Goal, goal, goal. Osborne, Andy Sanchez. Andy Sanchez had a great night for the Cardinals. Really impressed with his game. Led by example throughout. One of many Osborne players who had a great night. This was just such a a well-played game from both sides. Good energy. Good passion, physical without crossing the line. Just great, great stuff. Osborne wasn't done. They added a third to take it to 3-1 and actually go up in the aggregate lead because in this matchup, the Battle of Windy Hill, there was a trophy on the line for aggregate score between the two games. Now, the individual results count for the regular season records. It's Beyond me that these teams are not in the same region right now. GHSA, come on, what y'all doing? But there's a trophy on the line that's separate from the results of the games. Osborne getting the third goal to go up 3-1 was huge. Here's what it sounded like. A little over 40 yards from goal. The line is set a little deep here for Campbell. Free kick. Headed in, goal, 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 Osborne, 3-1. Alexis Gutierrez had that goal to take it to 3-1. And then, look, it, it was in a losing effort on the night, and ultimately it did force penalties in the aggregate score. But I don't want this goal to get lost in the shuffle. And when uh, video comes out from it, and I'm, I'm sure it will here soon, when video comes out from it, uh, I will definitely be sharing it because it is one of the goals of the season. I know I haven't seen all the GHSA games all over the state this year, but I will put this one up against almost anything because it was that that good for Matthew Gibbs. Long throw specialist, and he was causing havoc for Osborne all night long on the long throw. Well, sometimes that long throw comes back to you, and you have a decision to make. Here's what Gibbs did. It's a throw for Gibbs. 20 yards from goal. Gibbs launches it into the 18. Header won by Osborne. Gibbs controls. Left-footed shot. What a goal. What a goal from Matthew Gibbs. Goal, goal, goal off the half volley. 3-2. An absolute rocket. Goalkeeper gets a hand to it. Can't keep it out. It goes into the far side netting. What a goal. From Gibbs. That made it 3 2. Campbell could not find another one to take it to 3 3 to win the aggregate score of the Battle of Windy Hill or to get a result in terms of the regular season record. So Osborne wins the match 3 2. They go to 6 3 on the year. Campbell falls to 5 4. But 
since there's no away goals in the Battle of Windy Hill, which I'm good with. That's where the Champions League is. So, okay, that works. No away goals. Level on aggregate. Got to go to penalties. And in the penalties, it, it was such a, a cool thing to see. Talented goalkeeper junior for Osborne, Jacob Aguirre, had a collision with Jen and Sarah Magic. And it was a huge play. Uh, Aguirre had to come out towards the top of his 18 and make the play. Made a save. They collide. He goes down, and it was a right foot or ankle injury. Not sure. He was on crutches um, afterwards, and, and he was out of the game at that point. Junior Jorge Casas came in, finished the game, wasn't able to make the save on the goal from Gibbs, but he's in net for the penalty shootout. He made a save, a good save at that. Osborne had been perfect. It was 4-3, then 4-4 going into the last kick. Osborne kicked second, and an opportunity to win it. This is what it sounded like. Step to the left. Step to the left. Gutierrez. Goal, goal, goal. Osborne wins the battle for Windy Hill. Another huge moment for Gutierrez and Osborne lifts the trophy. They win the battle of Windy Hill on penalties. After it was level on aggregate, they won at Campbell. Campbell won at Osborne. Just a great, great rivalry. One of the many classicos that adds so much to Georgia high school soccer. Again, thank you to everybody at Campbell for having me out. All the great information. Same for you guys at Osborne. And I can't wait to see these games next season. And come on, GHSA. Get them back in the same region, please. All right. Rankings. Going to try to go through these just a little bit differently this week. One reason uh, weather played havoc with the schedules on Friday. So a lot of games got postponed, rescheduled. A lot of games are going to end up getting canceled. A lot of the non-region games, are just, there's just not going to be enough time to make those up. So we're going to go through the rankings in each classification with a few of the notable results from the week or notable upcoming games in that classification. So, let's start. 7A girls. Buford, number one. Archer climbs all the way up to number two. They were number six previously. Walton, three. Forsyth Central, four. Norcross, five. Mill Creek, six. Denmark, seven. Brookwood, eight. Hillgrove, nine. Campbell, ten. That was the Monday ranking at scoreboard.com. That's the coach's poll. Some of the notable results, uh, Buford with a 9-0 win at Collins Hill last night. Archer, big game coming up Saturday. They are going to face 4A ranked North Oconee in the Jekyll Tournament of Champions event. It's a huge cross-classification game. Really looking forward to that. Archer will host Parkview next Tuesday as well. Forsyth Central, next Tuesday, they will be at Mill Creek. That is a four versus six matchup. Huge, huge in 7A. Norcross, 7 0 winners Friday at Burkmar. Cameron Martin had four goals in that one. They followed it up with a 1 0 win Tuesday versus North Gwinnett. Denmark. They are playing tonight. They're hosting Milton. They will be a kind of a tricky game for Denmark next Tuesday, hosting 4A-ranked Northwest Whitfield. Brookwood, they lost 1-0 to Parkview, their eternal rivals. That was last night. Brookwood ranked number 8. We'll see if they hold on to that ranking in 7A after the loss. Hillgrove number 9. Thursday, they're going to play 4A-ranked North Oconee in the Jekyll event. And then Friday, they're going to play 6A-ranked St. Pius in the Jekyll event. Two big tests for Hillgrove. But the big result for them over the last week was a 4-1 win last night at, on the road, at 6A 
previously unbeaten Alexander Hillgrove removes them from the ranks of the unbeaten. Hillgrove has not lost the season 7-0-1, and and Alexander now has a blemish on their record. We'll get to them in a minute when we get to 6A. Campbell, they got ranked on Monday. They lost 1-0 at 6A ranked Blessed Trinity yesterday. So when you look at the rankings, you've got two teams at 8 and 10 in Brookwood and Campbell that lost. Campbell's loss is a little different. Brookwood's is, uh, again, it's at Parkview. Parkview has been kind of on that borderline of the rankings. They've been in and out this season. I'm wondering how the votes will go next week. A couple of teams to take a look at and, and some teams that still have an opportunity this week to improve their standing North Paulding, who's been right around the number 10 spot all season long, they had a 3-2 win on Friday versus Harrison, who was ranked. They fell out of the rankings, maybe because of that. North Paulding followed that up with a 10-0 win at home against Marietta on Tuesday. Thursday, they're playing 3A-ranked Bremen. I don't know if that will be enough to get them over the hump, depending on the rest of the results. It'll be very interesting. Meadow Creek is another one to pay attention to. They won last night against Peachtree Ridge. Richmond Hill is another one to pay attention to. Perfect 9-0 and record. 5-1 win last week versus St. Vincent's. 1-0 win Friday at Lowndes. 10-0 win Tuesday versus Camden County. They play Valdosta Friday night, and they play Hilton Head Prep next Wednesday. Richmond Hill, maybe not the same level of schedule that some of the other teams have faced, but they have not had a blemish on the record. 7A boys go through the rankings. Collins Hill, number one. Lambert, number two. South Forsyth, three. Denmark, four. Walton, five. Mountain View, six. Peachtree Ridge, seven. Hillgrove, eight. Berkmar, 9. Meadow Creek, 10. Now, there's been some action on the 7A boys' side. Collins Hill. And you're going to hear from Collins Hill coach Jamie Gleason here in a a bit on one of our in-session interviews presented by Kaiser Permanente. Man, this this is one of the best defensive teams in the state, first off. Now they've got eight straight clean sheets, but they've had to work for it. They beat Mountain View on the road Friday night 1-0. Then they hosted Buford yesterday, third-minute red card, and they found a way to overcome it. Coach Gleason will tell you all about it here in just a bit, but what a performance from Collins Hill. They are 11-0. and Lambert jumped up to two from six. One reason why, a 2-0 win on Friday on the road at now number three, South Forsyth. Lambert's got a little bit of time off. Next Friday, they'll be at Milton. Then they play Discovery at home on the 21st. South Forsyth, they've got some time to stew over that loss as well. Tomorrow, they will be at home against West Forsyth. And then Friday, the 17th, South Forsyth will be on the road at Denmark, who's number four now. We'll see what those rankings look like next week. But that's a very intriguing game. Denmark tonight against Milton, who just fell out of the rankings this week. Then Tuesday at home against Northwest Whitfield. On the boys' side, the Bruins are down just a little bit this year, but they've proven to be a difficult opponent for good teams. They just haven't been able to get the results needed. Walton, big win last night at 6A-ranked Sprayberry. That's huge for the Raiders. Mountain View, they had that loss to Collins Hill, narrow loss Friday night, 1-0. They followed that up with a 3-2 loss on Tuesday at Mill Creek. Mill Creek, just outside the rankings, might just get in next week. Peachtree Ridge, 2-1 loss last night at number 10 Meadow Creek. So where do they fall? They will play Norcross on Friday. Hillgrove needed penalties on Friday to win at Marietta. 2-2 overtime finish there. Burkmar. 5-3 5-3 win versus Norcross on Friday. They follow that up with a 4-0 win last night at Loganville. Meadow Creek mentioned the big 2-1 win at home against Peachtree Ridge. They have a very intriguing game next Tuesday, the Mustangs. They will be at 
1A Division I number one Atlanta International School. Fascinating matchup with 7A number 10 versus 1A D1 number one. Very intrigued by that one. Well, unfortunately, we won't be there for that one for an SDH game of the week, but I will be following up on that result. All right, other teams in 7A boys to keep an eye on. Osborne, you have to now at 6-3 and three with the win over Campbell. Next Tuesday, they will host 6A-ranked Riverwood. Really interesting game. Riverwood went to Campbell and beat them earlier this season. Osborne-Riverwood will be another big one, the 14th. Is stacking up some big games across the state. Mill Creek, I mentioned to them, they are doing really well in the region. They've just missed out on, on region tiebreakers the last couple of years. 4-2 win Friday at home against Tequila. 3-2 win last night against number four Mountain View. You know, it doesn't get any easier for them. Friday, they're hosting number one Collins Hill. Let's see how that goes. couple teams to outside the metro area to keep an eye on. In the 7A rankings, Colquitt County, the Packers 5-0-2. 3-0 winners at Camden County on Friday. This Friday, they will host Tift County. And Richmond Hill, 8-1-1 this year. 8-1 win Friday at Lowndes. 3-0 win Tuesday at Camden County. They'll host Valdosta on Friday and then Hilton Head Prep on the 14th. Let's move over to 6A. Girls, number one, a new number one, Marist. 6-0-2 6-0-2 oh, on the year. Number two, Lassiter. Three, Pope. Four, St. Pius. Five, Blessed Trinity. Six, Alexander. Seven, Roswell. Eight, North Atlanta. Nine, Alatuna. And ten, Noonan. Now, these rankings came out Monday. There's been some movement in 6A girls as well. Marist. Three nil winners last Wednesday at home against 5A number two, Midtown. This upcoming Tuesday, the 14th, just add it to the list of games on the 14th, Marist and St. Pius. They've played so many times over the years, but this is a one-versus-four matchup in 6A girls. Friday, the 17th, Marist will host Riverwood. Lassiter, 4-1 win Tuesday at Wheeler. They are hosting Alpharetta on Friday. They will host Johns Creek on the 17th. Pope, this Friday, at Roswell, who's ranked number seven. That's a huge game Friday night. St. Pius, now ranked number four. They've got that big game with Maris next week. But last night, St. Pius at home lost 2-1 to newly ranked number eight, North Atlanta. Really surprising result there. I, I guess just because it's at home to me, that was surprising. Going to St. Pius and getting results, that's not an easy thing to do. The Warriors got it done. They beat Lovett Wednesday. They beat St. Pius on the road last night. Now they'll play Lakeside DeKalb, a tricky one for them on the 14th. Then they will host Dunwoody on the 17th. Alexander, I mentioned them in the 7A side. First loss of the season at Hill or versus Hillgrove at home. Alexander Friday will be at Dunwoody, and then Saturday they'll play Heritage of Noonan at the Jekyll event. Roswell, 7th, that game with Pope coming up on Friday. Then next Tuesday they're hosting 7A-ranked Walton. Then the 17th they're at number 5 Blessed Trinity. The Hornets' schedule is brutal over the next few games. Alatuna, number 9 in the state, 10-0 winners Tuesday at Woodstock. They're at River Ridge on Friday. And Noonan, they got ranked on on Monday, or they they slid down the rankings a little bit on Monday. That was after a 4-2 loss on Friday at Alexander. 8-0 win to follow it up Tuesday against Douglas County. They'll be at South Paulding on Friday and then at Stevenson on the 14th. Just outside the top 10 in 6A girls. Lakeside, the loss to Riverwood knocked them out of the top 10. 10-0 10-0 win last night versus South Cobb. Tuesday, the 14th, at number 8, North Atlanta. Then the 17th, at home against number 4, St. Pius. Monday's Mill, 7-1 and one on the year. you got to pay attention a little bit to the Tigers down south. 3-2 win last week versus Alcove. 10-0 win Monday versus Jonesboro. Thursday, they're at McDonough. Wednesday, the 15th, they're at Charles Drew. 
next time we chat, Monday's Mill probably going to be eight and one on their way to potentially nine and one. Again, region maybe not as competitive as some of the others, but that record got to pay attention to Monday's Mill. Glen Academy. 3-1 loss on Friday at Grovetown. That was their first loss of the season. 11-2 win last night versus South Effingham. Friday there at Lakeside Evans. Tuesday versus Effingham County. Glen Academy, 8-1-1 and on the year. Habersham Central, 7-2 and on the year. They've got some games coming up against Appalachia on Friday and then at Flowery Branch, a really tricky one next Tuesday. 6A boys, new number one, Lassiter jumps into the number one spot. Johns Creek 2, Riverwood 3, Blessed Trinity 4, Lanier 5, Veteran 6, Sprayberry 7, Gainesville 8, River Ridge 9, and South Effingham 10. How'd we get here? Lassiter, they get the win yesterday at Wheeler. Got Alpharetta coming up, and then they go to Pope on the 14th. Johns Creek, this is why they have fallen out of the number one spot. They'd only conceded three goals all year. Friday, 3-1 loss at Pope. This Friday, at Kell, Saturday, Whitfield Academy. Next week, at Blessed Trinity on Tuesday. Riverwood, the win over Lakeside. You heard what it sounded like earlier in the show. They needed PKs to win at Dunwoody last night. 1-1 overtime finish there. Friday, they'll host McEachern. Tuesday, very interesting trip over to Osborne. Blessed Trinity number four. This Friday, they will be at Sprayberry. Then Tuesday, they will be hosting Johns Creek. Schedule for Blessed Trinity picking up a bit. Lanier, 10-0-1 on the year. They will be on the 14th hosting Appalachie and then the 17th at Habersham Central. Veterans, 11-0, but a big game coming up on Tuesday. Again, 14th, just add them up. Tuesday, Veterans hosting 2A number one Landmark Christian. Sprayberry, number seven. Seven straight wins after losing the opening game of the year at Southeast Whitfield. They beat Roswell on Friday, but then a 2-0 loss Tuesday at home against 7A-ranked Walton. Big chance for revenge. It's not going to be easy, though. Friday at home against Blessed Trinity, ranked number four. Gainesville, big win Tuesday versus Appalachie. River Ridge, back-to-back wins versus Etowah on Friday and at Rome on Tuesday. South Effingham, they got into the rankings on Monday. So many times, how, this is going to be a recurring theme today. They get into the rankings, then they lose the next day. A 3-0 loss, South Effingham versus Glenn Academy last night. Teams outside of the 6A rankings to keep an eye on. Pope, you have to after beating Johns Creek on Friday, 3-1. They're 5-3 and three on the year. Rockdale County, it's been up and down for the Bulldogs 3-0 loss last Wednesday in a rivalry game against Heritage of Conyers. They've won one since at Alcove. They've got a couple of games with Southwest DeKalb and Morrow coming up where they'll be favored. Lovejoy, another team down south got to pay attention to, but then they lost to Woodward Academy last week. They're, they're playing Dutchtown. They've got Forest Park coming up. Sequoia back in action Friday at Woodstock, Tuesday at Etowah. Glen Academy. Got to pay attention to them after beating number 10, South Effingham. They're 9-0. and They will be playing Effingham County next Tuesday after a trip to Lakeside Evans on Friday. That region is brutal in terms of travel. All right, let's move over to 5A girls. Shambly, still number one. There's not many changes in 5A girls in general. Midtown, two. Loganville, three. Harris County, four. Cambridge, five. McIntosh, six. Northside Columbus, seven. A little emphasis on those two. You'll find out why in a minute. Greater Atlanta Christian, eight. Jefferson, nine. Flowery Branch, ten. All right, how did we get here in 5A girls? Shambly's revenge tour continued on Tuesday with a 10-0 win against Cross Keys. They've got Tucker and West Forsyth coming up. 
Midtown first loss of the season last Wednesday, 3-0 at 6A ranked Marist. Bus was late. Team only got a 15-minute warm-up in that one, too. Really difficult for the Knights. Monday, they bounced back with a 6-1 win at home against Villarica. This Friday, they will be at Maynard Jackson. Loganville, back-to-back 10-0 wins over Winder Barrow and Burkmar. Friday at Clark Central. Then the 17th, Loganville will host Flowery Branch. Both teams could be ranked at that point. Four versus seven tonight in 5A girls. Harris County, you're going to hear from Jeff Renner. Talk to him this afternoon before the match. Harris County was the first team to 10 wins in the state. They're playing at home against Northside Columbus, who is 10-0-1 this year. The Tigers will go to Charles Drew on Friday. Northside Columbus comes into this. 10-0 winners last week against Russell County. 10-0 winners at Chattahoochee County on Monday. They follow up the game tonight with Harris County. They go on the road next Tuesday at number 6 McIntosh. The schedule for Northside Columbus is not pleasant at the moment. Cambridge next Tuesday will be hosting number eight Greater Atlanta Christian. Man, some of these games next Tuesday, I am telling you. McIntosh already mentioned it. Last night they had a really tough matchup, a 3-3 draw at home against 4A number nine Whitewater. Number nine, Jefferson, they had a win last night at Stevens County. They will play Eastside on Friday, then Winder Barrow next Wednesday. Flowery Branch won last night 7-2 versus Lakeview Academy. They'll go to Winder Barrow on Friday and then host Habersham Central on Tuesday. Just outside the rankings in 5A girls, Warner Robins, 9-1-1 on the year, but that first loss of the the season was last night, 2-0 at Union Grove. They're at Eagles Landing next Tuesday. Dutchtown is a perfect 8-0. 3-2 winners on Tuesday at Ola. They're at Lovejoy on Thursday. And then host Union Grove next Wednesday. Arabia Mountain in DeKalb County, 7-1. 5-1 win Friday versus Lithonia. 10-0 win at Cedar Grove on Tuesday. Their test is coming up on the 14th, hosting number one, Shambly. Maynard Jackson, another team you got to pay attention to, 6-1-1. One one. They beat Chapel Hill on Monday. Their test this Friday, hosting number two, Midtown. Let's go over to the boys' side in 5A. McIntosh, number one, and they're now 10-0. and 0. Dalton, number two. Clark Central, three. Chapel Hill, four. Tucker, five. Villarica, six. Greenbrier into the rankings at seven. Kell, eight. Centennial, nine. Midtown 10. These were the Monday rankings. What's happened since and what maybe got us here a little bit. McIntosh, 6-0 win last night at home against 4A number 4 Whitewater. Dalton, they were trailing Northwest Whitfield last week. 2-1, a little over five minutes left. They came back to win 4-2. Looping header from Zeke Ortiz. That tied it. Christopher Lopez. So dangerous on set pieces, Lopez. He scored the go-ahead, heading home a free kick, 2-12 on the clock. They added a penalty late. Epic comeback over the Bruins in Northwest Whitfield. Friday for Dalton. One of the games of the year. It was last year in Gainesville. Johnson beat Dalton there 5-4. This Friday, games at Dalton. 4A number one Johnson, 5A number two Dalton. What a match Friday night. Clark Central, 3-1 win last night at Eastside. Chapel Hill, their perfect 8-0, 7-0 win at Hiram last week, 2-1 win Monday at Maynard Jackson. Tucker, 7-1 win Monday versus Lithonia. Villarica, now 6-2-2, 3-3 draw at Trinity Christian last Wednesday. The equalizer came in the last minute of that one. The Wildcats followed that up with a 4-1 loss Monday at Midtown. They try to bounce back next week versus Maynard Jackson on Wednesday. Greenbrier, the Wolfpack, into the rankings for the first time this season. 3-0 win Friday at Ware County. 4-1 win Tuesday at home against Grovetown. Kell, they got into the rankings, but I don't think they're going to stay there, although they do have some opportunities. 
to maybe get their standing back. And, and let's get into it. So 2-1 loss Wednesday last week at Wheeler. 1-0 loss Friday versus Chattahoochee. 2-1 win Tuesday at Greater Atlanta Christian. But this Friday... 6A ranked Johns Creek in the Jekyll Tournament of Champions. Then Saturday against 3A ranked Oconee County in the Tournament of Champions. Kel's going to be wobbling in terms of the rankings, but you get a couple wins, they'll be fine. Centennial number nine, they got into the rankings, and then they lost on Monday at Kennesaw Mountain 3-1. Midtown, they lost 2-0 last week at Marist. They followed that up with the big 4-1 win at home against Villarica, who is ranked number six this Friday, Midtown at Maynard Jackson. A couple of teams outside the rankings to keep an eye on in 5A boys, Charles Drew. Not a ton of games this year so far, 4-0-1 on the year. But that one scoreless draw at Forest Park on Friday. This Friday hosting Harris County, and then next Tuesday they'll play Monday's Mill. And Bradwell Institute, 6-1-2, and 5-1 win last Friday at Coffee. This Friday they are at Ware County. 4A girls, new number one, it's North Oconee. Number two, Holy Innocence, three, Westminster, four, Cherokee Bluff, five, Perry, six, Heritage Ringgold, seven, Southeast Whitfield, eight, Stars Mill, 9 Whitewater, and 10 Northwest Whitfield. How'd we get here? What's coming up next? North Oconee, 7 and one on the year. This Thursday, they will play 7A-ranked Hillgrove in the Jekyll event, then 7A-ranked Archer in the Jekyll event on Saturday. North Oconee's about to get really tested against some schools in bigger classifications. We'll see how the Titans hold up. Holy Innocence, number two, big win on Wednesday of last week against Miller Grove, 12-0. They're back in action next Tuesday, hosting Hapeville Charter. Westminster, one of the top scorers in the state this season, Allie Ross, 26 goals for the Wildcats. They're 6-1. and one. They'll be back in action next Friday at Cambridge on the 17th. Cherokee Bluff. Back in action on Tuesday at North Hall. Then the 24th, go ahead and circle this one early. Cherokee Bluff at North Oconee, ranked number one right now. The Perry Panthers, perfect 10-0. and 0, 10 games, one goal conceded by the Panthers. 52 goals scored. 3-0 win Friday at Spalding in Griffin. This Friday, they will host West Lawrence. The Generals of Heritage Ringgold, 7-0-2. Big game coming up on Friday against the team right behind them in the ranking, Southeast Whitfield. Southeast Whitfield won 5-0 on Tuesday at Cedartown. The Raiders, after that game against Cedartown, this Friday, Heritage Ringgold, number six in the state. Then Thursday, the 16th, at Cross County Rivals, Northwest Whitfield. That's a huge game on the boys' side. It's going to be a huge game on the girls' side this year as well. Stars Mill, the Panthers, ranked number eight. Big 4-0 win Friday against Whitewater. That flipped them. Whitewater now number nine in the rankings. Stars Mill built on that with an 11-0 win Monday against Riverdale. But then a 4-0 loss last night at Northgate. Panthers, 6-4 and four on the year. Been very up and down this season. Whitewater mentioned the loss on Friday at Stars Mill. 3-3 draw Tuesday at 5A-ranked McIntosh. It's a big result for Whitewater there. Two goals from freshman Julia Hudson in that draw. Thursday, Whitewater will be at Sandy Creek, then Friday at home against Trinity Christian. The Bruins of Northwest Whitfield, 6-2 on the year. They beat Dalton last week. They beat Sonoraville this week. They will host Cedartown on Friday and in the big game on the 16th, hosting Southeast Whitfield. Outside the rankings, looking in, Southeast Bullock, 9-0. and And they've got a big win on their resume now. I think they get ranked next week. 3-0 win Tuesday against previously unbeaten, now 1-A-D-1, but previously unbeaten Scriven County. That's a 3-0 win for Southeast Bullock this week. They will be hosting New Hampstead on Thursday. 
LaGrange is another team you got to keep an eye on. Now, they're 6-6 six and six on the year, but a four-game winning streak. First win ever in program history over Columbus. Then they beat Sprayberry 8-0 on Saturday. Carly Perry had four goals in that one. 6-0 win Tuesday at Trinity Christian. LaGrange, if they can pull off a result Thursday at Stars Mill, I think LaGrange might get ranked in 4A girls. Let's see where that goes. Southeast Bullock, I think, could get in this time with their now 9-0 and record and the big win over Scriven County. Let's look at 4A boys. Johnson Gainesville remains number one. Westminster two. Southeast Whitfield three. Whitewater four. Perry five. North Oconee six. Lovett seven. Islands eight. Chestity nine. And East Hall ten. The Knights of Johnson. The big game is coming up Friday at Dalton. Then next Tuesday, don't sleep on it, at number nine, Chestity. Westminster, 5-0 win last week against Greater Atlanta Christian. They're off this week. They'll be back in action on the 17th, hosting Holy Innocence. The Raiders of Southeast Whitfield, back-to-back shutouts, 2-0 at Troop County on Saturday, 3-0 Tuesday at Cedartown, hosting Heritage Ringgold Friday. And then Monday the 13th, a little bit of an interesting matchup against a team that's just outside the, the rankings in the lower classifications, but is having a good year, Tryon. Whitewater, number four, they lost Friday at Stars Mill. They lost big 6-0 at 5A number one McIntosh on Tuesday. The Wildcats will try to bounce back Thursday at Sandy Creek and then Friday at home against Trinity Christian. The Perry Panthers on the boys' side, 8-1-1. They're hosting West Lawrence on Friday. North Oconee back in action next week, hosting Cedar Shoals on Tuesday. Love it. 12-2 win on Thursday versus Hampton. They'll be playing Tuesday, hosting Luella. Islands, a 2-0 win Friday at 2A-ranked Savannah Arts Academy. Caleb Swenson, assist and a goal. 8-1 win Tuesday for Islands at home against Wayne County. They'll be back in action next Tuesday, hosting New Hampstead. Chestity, the War Eagles, 9-2 on the year. 4-0 win last week versus North Hall. 7-0 win Friday versus Riverside Military Academy. 2-1 win Tuesday versus East Forsyth. East Hall, ranked number 10. They'll play Chastity on the 17th. East Hall needed PKs on Tuesday to beat Winder Barrow, scoreless after overtime. Friday, the Vikings will be at Walnut Grove. Outside the top 10 looking in, Clarkston, 8-2-1. and one. They have been ranked at one point this year. 11-1 win versus Cedar Grove. 6-0 win versus Stone Mountain. They'll play Druid Hills on Thursday and then at Southwest to Cab next week. Stars Mill, boys team has been up and down too this year. They won Friday versus Whitewater. They won against Riverdale. They lost at Northgate last night. Bainbridge and Shaw. Both right there, good teams this year. Bainbridge 7-1-2, and two, Shaw 9-1. and one. They played on Friday at Shaw, and Shaw won 5-2 in that one. Bainbridge came back with a 3-0 win. That was their only loss of the season. They came back with a 3-0 win Tuesday at Cairo. Shaw, in that 5-2 win, sophomore Andres Bonilla had four goals in it. They followed it up with an 11-1 win Tuesday at Westover. Bonilla had five in that one. Friday, they will be hosting Cairo. Spalding, 8-2 and two on the year. They had the, a loss to Perry on Friday, 4-0. 11-2 win on Tuesday versus Westside. Stockbridge is a team you got to pay attention to in 4A. 7-0-0 oh oh this season. 10-0 win at McDonough on Thursday. 2-0 win versus Woodland on Tuesday. They'll play Mount Zion at Jonesboro next Tuesday and then at Pace Academy on March 16th. 3A girls, new number one, Oconee County, 6-1-1. and one. They're number one in 3A girls. Lumpkin County, two. Morgan County, three. Dawson County, four. White County, five. Cahulla Creek, six. Wesleyan, seven. Bremen, eight. Hebron Christian Academy, nine. St. Vincent's Academy, ten. Oconee County, they're going to be at the Jekyll event 
Thursday, they're going to play the Academy of Richmond County. Then Saturday against 6A-ranked St. Pius. Lumpkin County, 2-0 win on Tuesday at Calhoun. Morgan County, 5-1 win last week versus the Academy of Richmond County. Dawson County, Thursday. Tricky game, potentially. They're 8-0-1, the Tigers. But Thursday, they are at 1A D2 number 4, Lake Oconee Academy. White County, big game on Thursday in 3A. They'll play at number 7, Wesleyan. That's a 5 versus 7 matchup in 3A girls. Cahulla Creek, they've got a ranked opponent as well. On Friday, they will host number 8, Bremen. Bremen, 6-4 and four on the year, but they've had some big wins. 10-0 win on Tuesday versus Cass. They will go to North Paulding, which is a tricky one. Then Friday, they'll go to Cahulla Creek. If the Blue Devils get results in those, they will climb the rankings. They've played a very tough schedule. Hebron Christian Academy, 8-0-2 oh, on the year, number 9 in the state in 3A girls. 1-0 win Friday at Calvary Day. 2-1 win Saturday at Effingham County. Senior Emma Martin with a goal in each game and assisted the other one in the game against Effingham County. She's got 11 goals now on the season. Followed that up with a 2-0 win Tuesday at Mount Pisgah Christian. St. Vincent's into the rankings for the first time this year, 4-2 and two on the year. 6-0 win Tuesday at Savannah Christian. Sophomore Anna Holsey with the hat trick in the win. They will be back in action tomorrow hosting Liberty County. 3A girls outside looking in. Adairsville, 7-3 and three on the year. Savannah Country Day, 6-0 and oh on the year. 3-1 win Friday at Hilton Head Christian Academy. 10-0 win Tuesday at Liberty County. Freshman Reese Bailey is leading the attack this year. Eight goals, three assists. Crisp County, the Cougars, 6-2 and two on the year. Sophomore Blakely Young scored five goals in their 6-1 win Friday at Carver-Columbus. Young, a sophomore, 22 goals now this season. Crisp County, though, after that win, 6-0 loss Tuesday against Columbus. They'll be back in action next week at Macon County. Pike County, 6-2 on the year. Keep an eye on them, along with the Academy of Richmond County. 6-3 on the year, and they've got some interesting games coming up. So keep an eye on the Musketeers at 6-3. 3A boys, top 10, number 1, Columbus, perfect, 10-0 and 0 on the season. Number 2, Bremen, number 3, Cahulla Creek, 4, Oconee County, 5, Savannah Christian, 6, Harlem, 7, Jackson, 8, Wesleyan, 9, Savannah Country Day, and 10, Pike County. Columbus has been number 1 for a while now, 7-0 win Tuesday at Crisp County. They'll play Greater Atlanta Christian on Friday. Bremen will play next week hosting Cartersville and then also hosting Adairsville on Friday. Cahulla Creek, back-to-back 10-0 wins last week at Ridgeland, this week hosting Lakeview Fort Oglethorpe. They will be at Lafayette on Tuesday. Oconee County, they'll be in the Jekyll event on the boys' side as well. North Paulding on Thursday, Kell on Saturday. Savannah Christian. Scoreless draw last Thursday against Jenkins. They bounced back with a 4-0 win Tuesday versus First Preparatory Christian Academy. Thursday of this week, Savannah Christian at Savannah Country Day. That's five versus nine. Harlem at number six has one of the leading scorers in the state, Carson Glidewell, 19 goals this season. Justin Green has 17 Assists for the Bulldogs. They're 8-2. and two. Jackson at number 7. They lost last night at number 10, Pike County. 6-1. They needed PKs on Friday to beat Peach County. Jackson trying to hold on to a top 10 spot going forward. Wesleyan, 4-1 win on Tuesday at Pickens. They're going to have a week off. They'll be hosting Decatur on March 21st. Pike County mentioned the win against Jackson. This Friday they are at Peach County. Teams on the outside looking in. Hebron Christian 7-1 and 2 on the year. Crisp County 7 and 2 on the year, but one of those losses 7-0 last night versus number 1 Columbus. 
Ringgold is five and one on the year. Franklin County six two and one, and Long County seven two and one. Two A girls Fitzgerald holding on to the top spot nine one and one on the year. Fellowship Christian two, Model three, Callaway four, Savannah Arts Academy five, Athens Academy six, Jeff Davis seven. Academy for Classical Education, 8. Central of Macon, 9. And Pierce County, 10. Decent bit of movement in 2A girls coming into the week. Fitzgerald, maybe the biggest game in 2A girls this past week. It was last night in Fitzgerald. They beat number 7, Jeff Davis, 10-0. Did not see that big of a margin coming. It's back-to-back 10-0 wins. For Fitzgerald, they beat Worth County on Friday, who was ranked at the time. Fell out of the rankings after that. Will Jeff Davis fall out of the rankings? We'll have to wait and see. Fellowship Christian, perfect 8-0 on the year, ranked number 2. 10-0 win on Tuesday versus Providence Christian. Model is a perfect 7-0 on the year. They won 4-0 Monday versus Fannin County. Callaway's only got one loss this year. That was their first game. 10-0 win last week at Towers. Friday, they will host Redan. Savannah Arts Academy, 6-3-1, but six straight wins. They went with a very difficult opening to the season. 8-0 win last week versus Appling County. Angelina Edding had the hat trick in that one. 10-0 win Tuesday versus Vidalia. Multiple hat tricks. Senior Valerie Capitan and freshman Amelia Ressi. Friday, Savannah Arts Academy will play Pierce County. That is a 5 versus 10 matchup on Friday. Athens Academy at 6. They, on Friday the 24th, will play 3A ranked Oconee County in a big one. The Spartans are 3-2-2 two, and two on the year. 10-0 win last week versus Union County. Number 8, the Griffins of the Academy for Classical Education. Friday. Eight versus nine matchup in Macon. Central will host the Griffins of the Academy for Classical Education. Then Tuesday, the Griffins will host Houston County. Pierce County, eight and one on the year. They get into the rankings for the first time on Monday. 10 0 win Friday versus Brantley County. 6 1 win Tuesday at Tattnall County. And they have the big showdown Friday at Savannah Arts Academy. Teams on the outside looking in, Worth County fell out of the rankings after that loss to Fitzgerald. They bounced back with a 2-1 win at Berrien last night. Toombs County, 6-3-1 on the year. 8-0 win at Vidalia Friday. They needed PKs to beat Appling County on Tuesday. North Cobb Christian, 7-1 on the year. 10-0 win Thursday at Coretta Scott King Young Women's Leadership Academy. Another 10-0 win Monday versus Kip Atlanta Collegiate. Thursday at South Atlanta for North Cobb Christian, and then Tuesday of the following week, hosting Walker. 2A boys, Landmark Christian, number one. Providence Christian, two. Union County, three. Fitzgerald, all the way into the rankings on the boys' side for the first time this year at number four. North Murray, five. Putnam County, six. Savannah Arts Academy, seven. Tattnall County, eight. Jeff Davis, nine. Fellowship Christian, ten. Landmark Christian, 10-0 win on Tuesday at Columbia, but they've got a big one coming up next Tuesday at unbeaten 6A-ranked veterans. 7-1 Landmark Christian, unbeaten veterans. Big gap there, 6A-2A, but I'm very interested to see that on the 14th. Number two, Providence Christian, 2-1 2-1 win on Tuesday at number 10, Fellowship Christian. That's a big win for the Storm. Doesn't get any easier for them, though. Friday, they will host number 3, Union County. The Panthers are 7-1 and on the year 4-1 win last night versus Gilmer. Mentioned Fitzgerald, first time they've been ranked on the boys' side, 7-3-1 and on the year. They beat Jeff Davis 6-2 last night, ranked number 9. Fitzgerald might be climbing up those rankings again on the boys' side. North Murray, 5. The Mountaineers, 7-1 on the year. They needed PKs last week to beat Murray County. Putnam County, 10-0 win versus Laney on Thursday. 10-0 win on Tuesday versus Washington County. Tattnall County at 8-3-1 win on Friday at Windsor Forest. 
but a 4-3 loss Tuesday versus Pierce County. We mentioned Jeff Davis and Fellowship Christian, both losing since the rankings came out. Just outside the rankings looking in, in 2A, boys, Drew Charter, 6-0-1. That is a state runner-up from 2022. 11-1 11-1 win Thursday versus Washington. PK win Tuesday for the Eagles of Drew Charter at Mount Perrin Christian. 1-1 overtime finish there. The Spencer Green Wave, perfect 7-0. 5-1 win versus Kendrick last week. 10-0 win Monday at Carver. The Westside Patriots, perfect 5-0. Shorter schedule so far. 8-1 win Thursday at Josie. 10-1 win Tuesday versus Laney. Pierce County, they had a big win this week. They have to be considered for next week. 8-1 and one on the year. 4-3 win Tuesday at Tattanall County. Now, Friday, they are at number 7 Savannah Arts Academy. They want to get into the rankings. That's their way in right there. 1A D2 girls, Atlanta Classical Academy number 1, Aquinas number 2, McIntosh County Academy, 3. Lincoln County, 4. Johnson County, 5. Lake Oconee Academy, 6. Atkinson County, 7. Georgia Military College, 8. Dooley County, 9. And Portal, 10. There will be some movement. Notable results in 1A D2. Aquinas, 8-0 win Tuesday on the road at number 8 GMC. Next Tuesday, they will be at number four, Lincoln County. Curious to see the movement there. 4-0 and so far this season, Aquinas. McIntosh County Academy, 5-3 win versus Portal on Friday. They bounce, or they follow that up with a 2-1 win Tuesday versus number seven, Johnson County. McIntosh County Academy might need to be number one. Just saying. They've got one of the top scorers in the state as well. Maddie McMahon, 25 goals this season. Lincoln County, this Friday, they will host GMC. And then next Tuesday, they will host Aquinas. Johnson County, they, they're ranked number five this week, but they lost last night at McIntosh County Academy. Next Tuesday, they will be at Portal. See if both teams are ranked at that point. Number six, Lake Oconee Academy. Thursday last week, they went to Commerce to face 1AD1, number two at the time, the Tigers. It did not go well for the Titans. 10-0 loss to Commerce in that match. Now, they stayed number six in the rankings. This Thursday, they will play 3A number four, Dawson County. Friday, they'll be at Greene County. Atkinson County, a 10-0 loss on Thursday at Georgia Christian School. Kept their ranking. They bounced back with a 2-1 win Tuesday at Lanier County. Next week, hosting Valdosta and Eccles County. GMC, 6-0 loss on Saturday versus Sprayberry. 8-0 loss Tuesday versus Aquinas. Now Friday, they are at Lincoln County. They need a win in a big way. Dooley County, 1-0 loss versus Hawkinsville on Friday. They'll get them again on the road next Saturday. Portal, 5-3 loss Friday at McIntosh County Academy. They bounced back with a 3-1 win Tuesday at Trutland. Friday, they will host Trutland, and then next Tuesday, they will host number 5, Johnson County. Towns County is the one on the outside looking in. Keep an eye on them. They are Friday at Aquinas. And then Friday the 17th at Lake Oconee Academy. They had a lot of girls playing basketball. Their season went a, a little ways. So 1-3-1 one, and one on the year. But the Indians of Towns County are expected to be a team to watch. So these next two Fridays will be their opportunity to make a little hay. 1A D2 boys, Lake Oconee Academy, number one, GMC two, Christian Heritage three, Portal 4, Atkinson County 5, Dooley County 6, Lincoln County 7, Chattahoochee County 8, Hawkinsville 9, and Mount Zion of Carrollton 10. Notable results or upcoming games in 1A D2 boys. Lake Oconee Academy, they will be next Tuesday. Again, the 14th. This is the, the 
the day of days in GHSA play. Number one versus number two in 1A D2 boys. It's going to be at GMC. So two will host one. Lake Oconee Academy has to travel for that one. GMC doesn't get like an easy game coming into that. They'll be at number seven Lincoln County on Friday night. Christian Heritage, they didn't have an easy one last night as they hosted 1A D1 ranked Dalton Academy. That finished 2-2 as a draw Friday. Christian Heritage will be on the road in Carrollton at number 10 Mount Zion. Portal, perfect 8-0, 10-3 win Friday at McIntosh County Academy. Jose Sanchez, 25 goals this season for the Panthers. Atkinson County, 10-0 win Tuesday at Lanier County. Dooley County needed PKs on Friday to beat Hawkinsville. That finished 2-2 after overtime. 10-2 win for the Bobcats of Dooley County on Monday versus Turner County. Dooley County will be at Hawkinsville on Saturday. The Red Devils ranked number nine now. They had that PK loss on Friday against the Bobcats. Tonight, Hawkinsville is at Macon County, and then Saturday they get the Bobcats at home this time. Lincoln County, 4-3 loss last night at Washington Wilkes. A surprise there. Chattahoochee County, 7-1 loss Monday versus Northside Columbus. A little bit of a surprise there. And in the Mount Zion Eagles, number 10, 4-0 winners Tuesday at Temple. They've got that big one coming up next Thursday against Christian Heritage. Macon County, outside looking in, 4-2 loss on Friday versus Chattahoochee County. They get an opportunity against Hawkinsville tonight. And Eccles County, 8-1 loss Thursday at 1A D1 Bacon County. Bounced back last night with a win at Brooks County, 1-0. They'll host them on Thursday. 1A D1 girls, new number one. It's Commerce, 8-1 and one on the year for the Tigers. They had that big win over Lake Oconee Academy last week. Then another big win, 10-0 Friday versus Athens Christian. And then another one, 10-1 win Tuesday at Barrow Arts and Sciences Academy. Ivy Tolbert, 13 goals in those three wins. She's got 36 on the year. She scored her 200th goal during her career during that span. She's only a junior, by the way, just to keep that in mind. Chloe Diaz is among the state assist leaders. When you have a goal scorer like that, somebody's got to be feeding Tolbert. Chloe Diaz has 16 assists. Next Tuesday, Commerce will host number eight, Tallulah Falls. Another game added to the list on the 14th. Number two in 1A D1 girls, East Lawrence. Three is Whitfield Academy. Four is Scriven County. Five is Bleckley County. Six is Paidea. Seven is Dade County. Eight, Tallulah Falls. Nine, Mount Vernon. Ten, Lamar County. How'd we get here? East Lawrence won't be number two after this week. First loss of the season last night at home to Bleckley County, number five. Not a huge upset, but an upset nonetheless. Whitfield Academy, they're back in action on Tuesday against Fellowship Christian, ranked in 2A. Scriven County, I mentioned them earlier, they had their first loss of the season, 3-0 last night at Southeast Bullock, who is undefeated this year. But Scriven County falls out of that ranking. They're 8-1 and one now. Number four in the rankings. Five, Bleckley County. They will move up eight straight wins. 9-1 win Friday at Jefferson County. The 1-0 win last night at number two East Lawrence. They'll be at Dublin on Friday. Paidea, they'll be back in action tomorrow night hosting Kings Ridge Christian. 4-1 and one on the year for the Pythons. Dade County, a loss last night against 5A Dalton, but it was a 6-0 loss for the Wolverines. Tallulah Falls, 9-3 win last night at Rabin County. Tomorrow night they will be at Elbert County before the big game on Tuesday at number 1 Commerce. Mount Vernon back in action on Friday at St. Francis. And Lamar County, the Trojans, 5-2 and two on the year. They're back in action on Friday as well, hosting Temple. Dublin is the team to watch outside looking in 1A D1 girls. 6-3 and three on the year. 4-2 win last night at Swainsboro. Friday, they will host number 5, Blackley County. 1A D1 boys, new number 1, Atlanta International School. 
Number two, Paideia. Three, Tallulah Falls. Four, Whitfield Academy. Five, Bleckley County. Six, Woodville Tompkins Institute. Seven, Mount Vernon. Eight, Dalton Academy. Nine, Bacon County. And ten, Jefferson County. The Eagles of AIS, seven, one, and one on the year. They won last Thursday at home against 4A, ranked at the time, Druid Hills. Now, Friday, they'll be at Auburn. Saturday, they will be at the Jekyll event, playing 5A, ranked Kell. And then Tuesday, another one for the 14th, 7A, ranked Meadow Creek. AIS will take on anybody, and they're, they're getting wins against almost anybody right now. 7-1-1. One, and one. Paideia, one of the craziest records in the state. They have not lost this season. They've played nine games. They've only won four. They've drawn five. Most draws in the state, I think. 1-1 one, one draw on Tuesday, just to continue the trend. That was at Pebblebrook. Tallulah Falls, perfect 8-0, 2-1 win on Tuesday at Rabin County. Whitfield Academy, 3-1 loss last week versus Pebblebrook. Saturday, Whitfield Academy, Whitfield Academy will play Johns Creek in the Jekyll event. And then Tuesday, the 14th, Whitfield Academy will host Fellowship Christian. Bleckley County, 9-3, 4-1 win on Friday at Jefferson County, 4-0 win Tuesday at East Lawrence, Friday at Dublin. Charlie Williams leads the Royals with 19 goals so far this season. Woodville Tompkins into the rankings for the first time this year. 4-2 win versus Royal Live Oaks Academy on Friday. They'll be back at it Friday this week, hosting Bryan County. Mount Vernon back at it on the 13th next Monday at St. Francis. Dalton Academy had that 2-2 draw on Tuesday against 1A D2 Christian Heritage. Friday, the Pumas will be hosting Dade County. Bacon County, 8-1 win on Thursday against 1A D2 Eccles County. Thursday of this week, Bacon County will host Swainsboro. And Jefferson County, they got ranked on Monday. They lost on Tuesday, 5-0 at Metter. Thursday, they will host East Lawrence. And then next Tuesday, they will host Dublin. The team on the outside looking in in 1A D1 boys is Tryon, the Bulldogs. I mentioned them earlier. 5-0-1 this year. 5-0 5-0 win last Wednesday at Darlington. Tonight, they're at Armucci. And then Monday, they are at 4A-ranked Southeast Whitfield. Keep an eye on the Bulldogs. For detailed coverage of the Dalton area, including Southeast Whitfield, make sure you're following Monday Night Football on Facebook and their show on WDNN. New episodes every Monday night during the season. You can watch them on YouTube. Look up WDNN. Those will air at 8 p.m. Big shout-out to the Gwinnett Daily Post for their great coverage of local high school soccer, always keeping everybody up to date with the scores, the scorers, uh, stories as well. Great stuff from the GDP. And make sure you're following Blitz for all the latest from Northeast Georgia, not just in soccer, but all high school sports. They're on Twitter at BlitzSportsGA, that's with a Z, and at BlitzSportsGA.com. I've got a list of active Georgia high school soccer accounts on Twitter. You can follow that. Just go to my profile at Longshoe, go to my lists, and you can follow the list. If I'm missing your school, follow me. Let me know. I'll get you added onto the list. If you ever have any news to publicize with your high school program, please let me know. You can find me on any social media platform at Longshoe. Coming up next on the show. It's the in-session interviews. I took over the interviews this week. If you're not sick of my voice, you're going to be soon. John Nelson's a little busy. He's out on assignment covering the GHSA State Basketball Tournament down in Macon. So the interviews fell to me this time around. Jeff Renner of the Harris County, both boys and girls. We talked a lot about the girls' team, 10-0-0 this year. They're playing tonight, hosting Northside Columbus. And we also talked to number one ranked from Collins Hill, 7A boys, Jamie Gleason of the Eagles. Perfect 11-0-0 on the year. After the break, you will hear from those coaches about how their teams got there, how they developed talent, and some of the secrets to their success. In-session interviews coming up next on Soccer is in Session, presented by Kaiser Permanente. Timeout. All right. Remember, we're a team that plays together. 
Listen, the winning will take care of itself. We just have to get everyone involved. In interscholastic sports, we celebrate what makes every one of us unique. And in the pursuit of a common goal, everyone in the huddle, in the bleachers, and in the community comes together. This message presented by the GHSA and the Georgia Athletic Directors Association. Welcome in to the In Session interview this week on Soccer's In Session, presented by Kaiser Permanente. I'm Jason Longshore, and I'm joined by Jamie Gleason of Collins Hill, the number one team in 7A on the boys' side. Jamie, how are you today? I'm doing just fine. How about yourself, Jason? Doing well. You guys are coming in off of a win last night. Another close one, but you get the job done against Buford. How'd it go? Uh, I started off tough. Uh, three minutes into the game, first foul of the game, first foul for either team, straight red card for um, senior center back. Um, just went into a challenge about 30 yards from goal. Felt like we had a couple guys behind the ball, but uh, denial of a goal scoring opportunity was ruled. Um, immediate red card was issued and had to play the rest of the game. 77 minutes a man down, but thankfully capitalized on a corner kick but about 10 minutes later um still felt pretty in control for the most part the guys have done so well this year and um again just another game where we had a chance to get a shutout that was our 10th of the season out of 11 games um and that sets the ties the school record for most shutouts so very helpful to have a great defense on a night where it doesn't start off so hot yeah that's the striking thing about you guys to me is as you look at the top ranked teams around the state and all the different classifications most are generally big high scoring teams, you know, one or two players who are setting the, the state on fire when it comes to goals. You guys are doing it with defense. You're the best defensive team in the league. You've only conceded one goal all year. What is it like for you to kind of instill that attitude into a high school team? So we've been really looking to find ways to be consistent game in and game out. I feel like Years ago, we started recognizing that we wanted to have this type of senior class um, and this type of just general environment of a team to be one that can get results on days where we're not doing so well or, you know, get results on games where we're really feeling like we're moving the ball in the right ways um, in the right spaces. So to have one goal against now this season is something that I can't tell you that I, I ever thought we would get to the here. Um, at this point, but I can tell you that I feel like the attitude, the culture has been something that kids have just bought into so well. I've been so appreciative of the energy they've brought. I mean, last night, I think is a stamp on that is, you know, being 77 minutes, me and a man down and just being willing to understand, listen, if we get scored on, if, if we're going to lose a game, we just want the other team to really have to work for it and um, to really have to go through us. And that's, I think the consistency thing for us is what we're looking to get done a lot in the past. We've had some of those back and forth games and they've not gone our way. And some days they do, some days they don't. But if you're very stout in the back and a proper team in terms of transitions, you can definitely make sure you're always in it to win it. And uh, that's kind of a, kind of what happened last night for us. You mentioned the development uh, a minute ago, and I think that's a critical element that, that maybe gets overlooked when it comes to, to high school around the state is the top programs do have a development pathway. You guys are planning ahead with ninth graders who come in even before that. What does that process look like for you at Collins Hill? So this all kind of started for us when the pandemic hit in 2020. So 2019, we had a great year, huge senior class. I think 11 seniors um, won the region, just an amazing time. No, sorry, second in the region and had a great year. I think we were number two or three in the state and we had to uh, play Lambert second round. Also number one in the team or number one in the state. Um, struggled, really struggled. They taught us a lesson, I think, in terms of how to play the game at a consistent level. Um, next year, we really rotated a lot, and it was a year where we were going to have to rebuild some things. And by the middle of that season, right around where it got canceled, we started seeing that we had six freshmen on varsity and guys that were really going to be pivotal moving forwards. And we just went ahead and threw them in the deep end. And every year, I feel like for us, we look to get our – no matter what age, the players who are going to be able to um, progress our program forwards, my mindset more so is telling kids, I'm building a team for four years, not one. And for them, they're looking to build, you know, to make a team for one season at a time. And 
obviously for me, I want longevity. I want every year. I don't want to lose a big senior class of 14, 15 and have to revamp right away. I'd much rather have solid classes of six and seven um, that are going to leave. And then the next class is kind of comes up right beneath them. So we normally only take, um, you know, it's kind of cutthroat in a way, but as seniors, you've got to be producing. Um, and if you're not in that lineup, it's hard for us to get you in it just because right. we want to make way for younger guys to take those spots that are going to be rotational coming off the side as substitutes or um, even reserves deeper down the lineup. Tell me a little bit about your, your coaching journey, how long you've been at Collins Hill and, and what prepared you for this role. Um, so uh, coaching journey, I started doing coaching licensing when I was in college up in North Georgia um, and they uh, local high school in North Hall reached out about anyone interested in coaching. Um, and I was, I really wanted to come down and help out and, found out that they would actually pay me to do it, which was pretty fun. <laughs> I thought it was going to be a pretty thing um, as a college kid, but um, started back in 2013 and just kind of started getting into the high school scene. I loved high school soccer. Um, I went to Decula High School. I played for Coach Mike Burrell, who is my assistant coach now, whose son plays for me now, which is pretty cool. Um, so went from North Hall for a couple of years, which I loved. Went to, um, I came down to Collins Hill. Now this is seven years ago. Um, as an assistant for two years to work for Coach Mike Burrell, who, again, I played for in high school. Um, and he basically understood that he wanted to start watching his kid play more and wanted to help a young coach be able to get his name on the map. And that's exactly what he did for me. And super grateful to him and his family and what he's done. And to be able to have this position, I took over as a head coach at Collins Hill at 26 years old. So that was – that was uh, – just a, a un, unbelievable blessing to be able to have that and have a program like this to be something where I could really breathe into and, and kind of navigate over time. So been super pumped to be able to have this place. Like I said, high school meant a lot to me. I had what a class of 11 seniors with me in my wedding. I had nine groomsmen, six of which I played high school soccer with. Oh, um, awesome. So, I mean, those guys made a big difference to me and I know how much this game can go far with high school and how much love there is to be able to be had and, yeah, just trying to insert that back into it. It's funny how small of a world it is. Uh, Mike Burrell, one of the, the great guys in, in Georgia high school soccer. I was in college and working for the Atlanta Ruckus when we drafted Mike Burrell out of Georgia Southern in yeah. 98. Um, the Ruckus were very dysfunctional at that time. So Mike had a much better career path outside of that. But he was somebody who always kind of stuck with me a as a player that I would have loved to have seen at the professional level. And he found his niche on the high school side. For sure. For sure. He definitely breeded a great culture at, at, at Tequila when I was there and really gave us a chance to love what we were doing every day. And I think that had a lasting mark on all of us, um, including myself, who's wanted to come back and do it and do it at a full time. So as you look around the state, I feel like and, and I'd love to get your take on this. The, the last couple of years and, and maybe it's, you know, just bouncing back from the, the pandemic season or whatnot. The level across the state, you know, all the games that, that we're doing, it feels like it's really jumped up a couple of notches here in recent years. Absolutely. I think with DA kind of fizzling some a couple of years ago, um, and that was really in 2022, wasn't it? Uh, yeah. Where we just got some of those elite players back. But then again, I also think in certain locations you do have uh, Atlanta United kids still playing on the side, um, guys who have maybe already committed or older but some guys that are just in good communities that their parents really want them to partake in high school soccer. And um, they've been added to rosters all around the place. We don't have any necessarily right now, but I'm hoping in a couple of years as the couple of guys that are in our halls that are at Lane United kids, um, as they get older, maybe by their senior year or junior year, they may become involved because I'll tell you, man, some of the quality is really getting there. And also I think the coaching is getting a lot better, man. Yep. What a region that we're in. And I, I just feel like soccer is getting a little bit more, teacher base as well. People coming in with licensing and people coming in to really make a big difference. And you're seeing it on the field. That's for sure. Big game on Friday with Mill Creek. They've been on one of our games of the week this season. What are you looking for in that one? Um, so with that, with that red card, it comes at a poor time. I mean, yeah. we've scored five goals in four games in region, all with shutouts, which is great. Mill Creek has only had one shutout, but man, they're on a tear. I mean, they've scored, I want to say 15, 16 goals across those four games averaging four goals a game. So going to be a great matchup for us. They've been a team in the past that I'm always aware of the way they play and how well they do and how dynamic they can be. They're very similar 
They've got a great senior class and a couple great athletes. So it's going to be a big match. That's for sure. Really looking forward to seeing the results of that one and the rest of the season for you guys. Thanks so much for taking the time and good luck the rest of the way. I appreciate it, Jason. Thank you, man. Welcome back. Our latest in-session interview presented by Kaiser Permanente is with Jeff Renner of Harris County, the first team to get to 10-0 and 0 in the state this year. And Jeff, first off, congrats on a great season. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, we're excited about it. You guys have a huge match tonight. We're talking this afternoon before the show airs. Northside Columbus also at 10 wins this year. Mm-hmm. Give us a little bit of a preview. Yeah, in fact, if you look at uh, the goal scoring, too, we both got a couple of the top goal scorers in the state. Uh, but it's big. It's a, it's a region match. Uh, like you said, they also have 10 wins. Um, we This is my first year coaching our girls' team. I've been coaching the boys' team for a few years, and uh, uh, we're real excited about what's going on. I honestly didn't. You know, I, I thought we'd have a good season, but I didn't expect it to go uh, quite as well it, as it is. Um, and but we're, you know, after every game, we're wondering, you know, how much competition have we played already? Because we're not sure if we've seen the best yet or not. But I'm sure with Northside tonight, we're going to have a tough game. Yeah, huge test tonight. And with with such a good season going on, is there anything you can pinpoint that is helping to spark this undefeated year so far? Uh, well, I mentioned my striker, uh, Reese Wise, uh, has, I think, 19 goals so far on the season, uh, averaging about two goals a game. Um, speed, uh, speed kills. Uh, we've got speed up front. Uh, we've got a back line, uh, play three in the back, uh, three very fast girls. Uh, one of them is actually my daughter. Um, and a uh, big reason why I'm coaching the girls team this year, but, uh, but we've been able to chase people down in the back and outrun them up front. So what's the biggest difference for you going from coaching the boys to now coaching a girls team? Uh, the girls listen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's exciting. Uh, within my first couple of weeks of coaching the girls, um, I was just walking around the field while we were working on something. And I heard one of the girls say to one of the other girls said, he said to do it like this. And I was real happy to hear that. You don't always, you know, I love the boys, uh, but you don't always hear that with the boys because uh, they can be hard-headed at times. So uh, so I, that's exciting. Um, the bus rides are quieter. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, I'm enjoying it. What's the, the soccer culture like? Are the students coming out to support this team with the run you guys are on? Is it starting to, to build some buzz? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> not not so uh we actually we've had a few the last couple games uh that came out um i think they're trying to encourage others to come out um but no it hasn't really picked up steam a whole lot yet um we haven't advertised it as much around the school as we possibly could uh, but that's because we've been so busy working on what we're doing so um i i think uh you know we're getting into our region games this week and it's gonna you know stir some excitement we've got uh, north side tonight and then we have drew on friday and uh, we've got mcintosh and northgate next week so all four of our region games all right in a row so it's going to tell us a little bit more about where we are because uh all those teams are very good you know top teams in the state so yeah the tough tests with the one tonight with north side and mm-hmm. then mcintosh coming up next week right and then northgate too uh northgate's yeah. record both northgate and mcintosh their record's not that impressive right now but i think they've played some really tough teams uh those are both uh real good squads when you when you look at that step up in, in competition you know what have you said to your girls this week to kind of prepare them uh, well, they know a lot of these girls. Uh, our, our girls and the North Side girls uh, play on the same club team, uh, several of them. Uh, they've known each other for years, so they know what they're up against. Uh, like I said, we're real excited about what's going on. We moved some people around at the beginning of the year, and it's working for us. Um, and going into these games, I mean, there's some nerves that get, you know they kick up and stuff. Like I said, they know who they're playing against. They know, uh, I mean, North Side's been very good for several years. Uh, so we, we know what we're up against, but we've uh, we've it's starting to build up uh, quite a bit of confidence when you're going out and winning every game. So and we've we've tried to get around a little bit, too. We've played uh, played a few schools up in Atlanta, uh, trying to play some schools that we haven't played before and stuff. And uh, 
you know, try to see where we sit in the state. It's still tough to tell, uh, you know, because we're all playing different teams, and, and sometimes it's time to uh, tough to get a good comparison uh, among a couple of teams. So, is that a big focus going forward? You know, we're, we're starting to see more teams around the state play those out of not just out of area but also out of the mm -hmm. classification matchups to get those early season tests mm -hmm. is that something that you think is important uh, i think it is uh, you know i i wanted to get around uh, when i was our, our schedule was partially done when it came to me uh and right. then as i started looking at other games uh you know i'm coaching the boys team and the girls team so uh you know i'm looking for games sometimes it's tough to find uh you know, you might find a really good girls team, but their boys team's right. not as good. A really good boys team and the girls team isn't any good. So trying to schedule games for both of our teams, it'll be worthwhile games. But but we started looking more up in Atlanta stuff because pretty much anywhere around here, we're going to have to travel anyway. Uh, right. We're, you know, we're just outside of Columbus. Uh, but to find the, you know, the good soccer schools, we've got to travel a little bit. You know, I mean, there's some good schools in Columbus, don't get me wrong, but yeah. uh, but to find some other competition. So we did. Uh, we had a couple of 7A schools this year, at least one 7A school and just some other 5A schools we hadn't seen. Uh, so I, I think that helps. Uh, and it, it's neat just to get around, too, and see what other people are doing. So It's always interesting talking to, to coaches about that non-region part of the schedule because mm -hmm. it feels like coaches are in two camps. You know, One is we want to test our teams. They go into the mm -hmm. region. They're ready to roll. The others are like, we want to build confidence and we right. want to get some wins and, and get some of those those goals on the board before mm -hmm. we get into the region. I don't think there's a, a right or a wrong. It depends on the team that you have. Right. Yeah, I agree. I think, uh, of course, you know, I don't want to go into our region games and get smashed the week before, you know. Right. Um, and, and winning would be good, but I don't want to go out and mercy rule somebody the week before our region yeah. games either. So, you know, when you're doing that schedule, you're trying to find that mix in between. And, and like I said, with our girls, uh, we weren't expecting, you know, 10 at 0 at this point in the season. Um, you hate to not expect it, but, you know, it's tough to expect it. Um so, you know, when you're looking for that schedule, like there was one team that we were scheduled to play recently that uh, that was a much better team last year and we weren't as good last year. So then right. as you're coming up to, you know, that game, you're looking at it and it's probably going to, you know, we're going to end up tearing them up and stuff, you know, but you, know, you don't ever know from year to year. So, yeah, it's it's always hard to predict. Um, mm. One other element that I've kind of gotten into is I'm starting to see some common threads around the state in different areas is the development side and like where the, the players are coming from, whether it's club or freshman teams and JV teams, what does that look like for you on, on the boys side, since you've got more experience there and, and are you trying to put some of those practices in place? Well, I tell you the the club stuff has gotten so big and yeah. I probably shouldn't say this, but I'll say it. I'm not a big fan of the clubs all the time. I, I know with our middle school kids, I helped out with our middle school team this past fall and a club down here in Columbus is telling the kids don't play club or don't play middle school soccer. I don't think that's any of their business. Right. I mean, it's been proven, you know, kids that are involved in school do better in school. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I don't agree with that. You know, it's, you know, it's all this money stuff that the clubs are doing. And I mean, some of the kids are getting, uh, I mean, the top teams, you know, great, uh, getting great coaching, well-developed, uh, but the whole thing comes down to money. Um, and, and you, you've got clubs that are, that have enough, enough kids for maybe one, you know, one and a half teams in a certain age group, but they go ahead and, you know, put in two teams where you got one sub on each team. And, and the thing is they brainwash the kids into thinking that this club is where everything's at and the high school's not. And I, I disagree with it. I'm sure there's people that won't like that. Uh, but no, I'm right there. I, I don't like the how they try to control what these kids are doing. I mean, and, and I'm not saying they're not learning great things with the clubs. Right. Uh, they've right. got great coaches, a lot of them, you know, um, but they can bring that stuff to the high school field and still continue working on their game uh, without being told they shouldn't play for this team or shouldn't play for that team. Uh, you know, most of them are looking at going to college. You're going to be playing for schools, you know, and, I'm not uh, now I can tell you that going into this season, like I said, we moved some girls around. Uh, they've learned a lot from the clubs and their parents mm -hmm. have spent enough money that I ought to be able to put them in a position and they know what they're supposed to do. And I think that happens. So they, you know, they are learning a lot, but at the same time, I, I don't like when they just try to control their lives and all that. So, 
Yeah, no, I'm completely with you. And, mm-hmm. and and this is something that's a big reason why we do what we do here on the show. The right. the value of soccer in schools mm-hmm. is so high. And there's a place for both. The, yeah. It shouldn't be an either or. You know, I was just speaking to Collins Hill on the boys side. And, mm-hmm. you know, when you're talking about 15, maybe 20 players in the state who are part of Atlanta United's academy on the boys and are close mm-hmm. to a pro contract. Mm-hmm. OK, different conversation. Sure. But everybody else there's huge value in playing in school right uh, yes uh, the, the academics the mm-hmm. atmosphere the community aspects of it there's just I, I i don't like hearing when clubs are telling kids not to play in school that always right. frustrates me especially like i said middle school yeah they're telling the middle school kids not to play middle school and it's like are you kidding me and and the thing is i'm happy to work with them if i've got a yeah. kid who's going to miss my practice because he's going to a club practice great you know, right. go work real hard. Come back and show us what you learn tomorrow. Right. You know, I can work with somebody like that. I don't like just the whole control thing. I just think it's crazy. I agree with you. It, it, yeah. it shouldn't be happening for kids mm-hmm. who are, are learning the game and playing for fun and hopefully going to go on to college. But most right. of them aren't. And they're going to be, <laughs> you know, they're, they're going to go on to be the next level of coaches. Right. We, we need them to enjoy their experience. And we see some that actually quit before they get to the high school team. We had a keeper a couple of years ago who had had, uh, you know, personal trainer for years and worked, you know, two days a week, driving an hour to go work with somebody. His junior year, he quit, you know, quit club, quit high school, quit playing soccer. He'd had enough, you know. So I think the pressure that's been put on him at a young age is you don't need to do that. And like you said, there's only a handful of them that are going to keep moving on. And, you know, those kids will keep moving on. They don't have to play, you know, every day for a club and, not, you know, not go anywhere else. So. It's it's a process. Uh, mm-hmm. I think it's getting better in general, but mm-hmm. yeah, there's still areas where we've got to educate folks on on how big of a deal playing for right. your school is and right. playing for your community is. You guys have a big one tonight with with Northside yeah. Columbus. I can't wait to hear about it next week. I can't wait to see the progress that you guys continue to make this year. We'll be following closely up here in Atlanta. Awesome. Thank you. Why are interscholastic sports called the last classroom of the day? Because they teach students important life lessons like teamwork, accountability, and perseverance. School sports are so much more than a game. They're about developing the whole person. That's why they're an essential part of every student's education. Encourage your student to participate in the last classroom of the day. Interscholastic Sports in Georgia. This message presented by the GHSA and the Georgia Athletic Directors Association. Welcome back. Soccer is in session presented by Kaiser Permanente. Soccer down here's look at everything going on in soccer in schools across the state of Georgia. High schools play in the spring. The colleges will play in the fall. Kind of flip the script on things as we get later into the year. But also want to thank Jamie Gleason of Collins Hill and Jeff Renner of Harris County for their time today to Perfect coaches so far this season. Unblemished records, although Harris County's got a big one tonight with Northside Columbus. We'll talk about that next week, how that goes down. Other news off the pitch. Selma Ferris of Brookwood High School has been called up to represent the U-17 Bosnian national team. Big congrats to Selma for that. Commitments to get caught up on Mountain View High School and GSA attacker Obed Salmaron has committed to a Lincoln Memorial University. Another GSA player, Loganville High School's Dylan Persinger, has committed to Emmanuel College. And Central of Macon and Legion FC midfielder Joel Callens has committed to Hiram College in Ohio. Dalton State, great year last season for them. They announced the transfer of Callum Sherry from the University of West Alabama. Sherry is originally from the Isle of Man. If you don't know it, look it up. I highly recommend it. Liam Doyle plays for, uh, played for Nashville SC back in the day. Uh, I believe is on the coaching staff with Jack Collison at Huntsville City in MLS Next Pro. But Callum Sherry from the Isle of Man will join the program at Dalton State in the fall. 
Joining on the women's side is Marissa Gonzalez, committing from Southeast Whitfield, just down the road, having a great year, too, the Raiders. Marissa Gonzalez committed to Dalton State. Oglethorpe announced the signing of Chris Veglia out of Hollywood, Florida, and the Weston FC MLS Next youth program. Georgia Southern announced a couple of signings. Franklin Spires of Lexington, South Carolina, is committed to the Eagles, and they've signed Rasmus Linden of Denmark for the upcoming fall season. Young Harris, on the commitment side, they signed Evans High School attacker Finley Engel for the upcoming fall season. And then on the product side for Young Harris, James Thomas and Siba Andreasen have signed with one Knoxville SC of USL League One, first year as a pro team in Knoxville. And Ben Mackay has signed with Nisa's Savannah Clovers. Big congrats to Young Harris College on the addition of Finley Engel. And, you know, it's an accomplishment when these schools are producing pros. And that's three from Young Harris College. Upcoming games of importance. I mentioned a ton of games on the 14th. I wish we could be at all of them. I don't have clones. We're going to be at Trinity Christian. North Clayton will be there on senior night. That'll be one of our SDH games of the week next week. And then the 17th, you're going to have to wait to find out. We, We saved a few dates that could be flex scheduling for the season, and March 17th is going to be one of those. So results this week will really kind of help us determine uh, as we're looking for games that might determine region winners, uh, big games around the state. So stay tuned for March 17th. That one is TBD. Make sure you're following us on social media at Soccer Down Here. Thanks to John Nelson for hanging out with me in the booth at Riverwood last Friday. Thanks to Jarrett Smith for hanging out with me in the booth last night at Campbell in the Battle of Windy Hill. And thanks to everybody who has been listening and consuming the product, helping us cover more deeply this great high school soccer scene in the state of Georgia. means a ton to me. I know it means a lot to you guys out there as well. And I'm glad that this show is... uh, Maybe crossing some boundaries and helping people learn about the high school game, but also learn about some different areas of the state that you might not know about and how soccer has grown in those communities and is going to continue to grow. Can't wait to see all of it. We're maybe midway through the season now. Playoffs coming up not that far away, and then the state finals will be the first week in May. Cannot wait. Thanks for, thanks for being along for the ride on Soccer Is In Session, presented by Kaiser Permanente. We'll be back next Wednesday. Have a good one, everybody. Mucha plata, y'all.